issues. Uh, we're changing the topic slightly within the same framework because some people are, have to go back to work tomorrow and they would, they would like that we focus on things that, that they're particularly interested in and this one was waqf. So I decided to hold off on the history which was already taking too much time and uh, focusing on waqf for today. The other thing is we have sisters who are sitting uh, at the back if you prefer to sit at the back by all means if you'd like to sit in front uh, there are sisters sitting in front and you can join them um, and I don't have a number three so we're going to start with waqf but before we do uh, in modern economics you have a, a development that didn't exist in the past in the past you had uh, personal ownership, private ownership, and then you had a partnership. You didn't have a corporation. Corporate identity is a development of this modern world. And it differs from personal ownership and from partnership and in that the corporation is a persona. It's an artificial persona. It's like a human being except that it's not. So your interest in that particular corporation is limited, that's why it's called limited, to the extent in which you have an investment. As opposed to a personal or private entity where if your creditors come after you, they, cannot stop, they don't have to stop anywhere. So if you've defaulted on a loan, right, back to 101, <laughs> If you've defaulted on a loan, then not only are they going to take the immediate assets that are connected to that particular loan, but any other assets are, that are needed to cover that loan, see? Whereas in a corporate structure, your liability is limited to your investment in that particular commodity. So you invested in, in GM and someone goes after GM, you're going to lose your shirt only to that extent. So this is a modern development, but it has its, its, its roots within Islam in a very interesting way. It goes back to the waqf. And it's, it's actually in the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. He, he encourages, so let me, let me share the story with you. Omar, remember we said yesterday that when we got to Khaybar, then our asset base changed, right? Whereas previous, previously we had movables, now we have immovables as well. And that creates its own set of problems. Oh yes, number three. Oh my God, I'm looking at this guy. I haven't seen him in years, but uh, his wife in particular and everybody else says, I, we must uh, relay the question. So do we have a mic that we can pass around? Oh, there we go. There we go. So that problem is solved. Uh, so, so you have movables and immovables. So if you have land and so on, how do you distribute that? But remember, all of this is, you know, <laughs> nobody's asked me this, but you would say, but why didn't a verse come down and just sort the problem out? That's a fascinating question. Fascinating question because verses do come down. But they have a pattern of coming down. They don't seem to come down or they have to have come down to, to, to give too much direction for the Qusay element of, of the seerah. Remember we made, we said there are two elements, the Abrahamic element and the Qusay element. In the Qusay element, divine intervention seems to be limited to some extent. So Omar is an heir to one of these properties. And so he says, Ya Rasulullah, I want to give this property away. Peace of Allah. You know that mentality of giving away things? So Rasulullah said, don't do that. Okay, okay we got it. Uh, this is what he said. He says, you, what you do is, you hold on to the property, you turn it into, I'm not sure, I, want, I, want, I have to check it itself, I'm not sure if you used to walk. But he said some very, very interesting things. He says, you can, for instance, do the following. 
three or four things, inshallah, we, we'll get to, get to the hadith. <coughs> it says, you can uh, give the usufruct of that property. Right? It says, you keep the property, usufruct, in other words, whatever use of that property it was. You can give it, you know, you can get your family to, to, to benefit from that. They can take care of it. And you understand, so the family uh, uh, gives this in trust, but they are looking from it. He, he creates that, that corporate identity at that time. He tells Omar, give it, give it in charity, but hold on to it. He says, give it in charity, but hold on to it. Generally, when you give it in charity, what happens is, this is why I got this. There, there are three kinds here, yeah? and we'll, we'll get to that now. But when you get in charity, you lose ownership of it. Right? When you give something in charity, you lose. So uh, Rasulullah is suggesting you don't give it that way. You give it in charity, but don't lose ownership of it. See? So what happens? What, what is that property of Omar now? That is a separate corporate structure. You understand the, 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 the resemblance there between the modern corporate structure and here this suggestion of the Prophet وسلم, in 7th century Arabia it's talking about something that has its own identity. It protects the property. All, if you think of why is he saying A, B, C and D, in, if you bring them together, it protects that property. By the way, waqf is something that, that uh, I'm just throw this in quickly. It's something that is much neglected today, and it's something that we have to think about very seriously, very seriously. When the Ottoman Empire fell and Turkey became an independent state, and because Turkey was more advanced than most other states, they did a land audit. You know, like you know, we we do our own audits. We did a they found one third of the entire country was waqf. One third of Turkey was waqf. This is how vibrant waqf as an instrument for succession was in the Muslim Ummah. I want you to remember that. You know, you had, you had the, the revolution during the Enlightenment when the church was kicked out. Right? Maybe you don't. Anyway. So the Enlightenment is what gave us whatever we have today in terms of ideas. The Industrial Revolution is what gave us in terms of technology. So if you think technology, think Industrial Revolution. If you think ideas, democracy, individual rights, all of those things, those things come from the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a reaction to church authority. The church owned one third of Europe. Hmm. That one third that was owned by, 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 by Waqf was not owned by the state. That's why you have this different, different interpretation of Waqf. So Muslims were, were working with different interpretations of protecting the Waqf, not just from, from uh, uh, greedy hands at the private level, but even at the state level. How do we protect this? So this one third is something you should keep in the back of your mind when you think about, wow, this was really good. I mean, one of our great achievements is that we had so much of land that was all waqf. So he dies, he gives it off waqf. But nobody does an audit, so you don't know how much you have. And that's just Turkey. We don't know what happened in, Tur in, in, in places like Damascus and so on. You know, all of those lands were all governed by Islam. And uh, surely they had a huge amount of the, of the real estate that was given off in waqf. <laughs> And we'll talk about the problems that, that come with Waqf as well. But for now, if you have any questions, please ask. Somebody, somebody's come with a whole list of questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to do that right now. So, so this is just a, a prelude to the presentation that this, the idea of corporate identity is not, is not totally alien to us. So we look at what is the difference between Waqf, Mirath, and Wasiyah. There's two common ter three common terms we find when we're talking about 
uh, Muslims and property and distribution and so on. Yes, my the other thing, number four, my body's been talking to me, especially my back and my hips, and they're telling me you can't stand. So you have to excuse me. So what is the difference between waqf, mirath, and wasiyah? Uh, well, these are some of the differences. In waqf, you have complete, as the owner of a waqf property, you have complete uh, discretion on how you distribute that property. Within, obviously, the confines of the sharia. You have complete discretion, you understand? You know, what, we know, you know what I'm talking about, right? In, uh, in Mirath, you don't have complete discretion. You don't have complete discretion. You have discretion to, to, the, le to the extent of one third. So if you, owe, if you, if you leave behind a thousand dollars, then you can distribute three hundred and thirty odd right dollars as you see. Then that's your discretionary power over one third. When you leave, when you die, you either leave your state, your your, your estate, interstate or testate. Interstate is when you die without a will, and testate is when you leave a will. So this is this is similar to that, all right. This thing gets somewhat technical. Not every one of you has this background. So if you no harm in asking, just ask the questions and inshallah we'll try and answer them to the best of our. Yeah, ownership. That's ownership. Irth. Yarithun. Irth. Yes. We will, we will. So, so y pay attention to the distinctions I make so that you can, I'm giving you the building block so you can make the own defin your own definition. So in, in all three cases, it's property that you hold. Mm, another point I must tell you. In Islam, you don't own property. You hold property. Why? Because... No, what is the verse? Read it again. And, and to Allah belong everything in the heavens and the earth. So you don't own property, you hold property. It's a very different concept. That is true for all assets. Well, property, in, in general property. I mean, by property, I mean all everything, yes. You don't own it, you hold it. And because you hold it, you don't have full discretionary power over it. Now you understand it. Because you hold it and you don't own it, you don't have full discretionary power over it. You can't just do with it what you want to. Either because the law itself doesn't allow you to, or because morality doesn't allow you to. You are the judge of, mor of your akhlaq. The faqih and the mufti is the judge of your, of, of your ahkam. The two things you must understand. There is akhlaq, your morality, and there's ahkam, your rules and regulations. In terms of whether you should give your money that you've earned, you should give it to the, uh, to, uh, let's find something ridiculous. Uh, can't think of something. Uh, whether you should give it to that or give it to, to the poor. Should you, should you give it to, should you give it to, all of these things are actually really good. Uh, to, to people who are, restore, car restoration, I love cars, so I'm going to bring it. Car restoration, you know, we have a museum for car restoration. Think about it, we have it in Troy, we are putting it up, car restoration. Should you give it there or should you give it to the, 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 uh, the animal welfare? Right? Good contrast? Car restoration, animal welfare, and the poor and the indigent, where should you give it? The faqih can advise you, he cannot rule on that. You understand? The faqih, in other words, the jurist, he can advise you, he, can, he, cannot, he cannot rule on that. The state cannot get involved in that. Your conscience has to do that. Your conscience will determine whether you're going to go with A, B, or C. 
But if you come, like this is what happened at the time of Rasulullah, if you decide that you had three slaves and you give them all in the path of Allah, then the heirs can go to the, to, to the judge and tell him, this is what my father's done. He's left us destitute. He has distributed all three heirs, all three slaves in the path of Allah. So Rasulullah says, no, a thulth wa thulth kathir. He says, you can give up to one third. You cannot give more than that. So you have discretion, this discretionary authority over one third. All right? So that has to do with mirath, your inheritance. The, 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 the word that we know more commonly. That obviously comes, it, it ends up on this side. Of your one third, you can do that. Or you can do here. You can move it. You can either put it into a waqf or you can give it here wasiyah. But in, in Sunni Islam, there are some, some no-nos as far as wasiyah is concerned. You cannot, Sunni Islam doesn't allow double dipping. So if you're an heir who will inherit because, of, because you fall into the category of the, of the, 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 the rightful in, inheritors, right? Uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow, inshallah. Then you cannot be given was, uh, uh, from here, from wasiyah from the one-third. In Shiite Islam, you can. The basic difference between Shias and Sunni is that they allow it, we don't, yeah. Not necessarily. Good question, not necessarily, but, but generally. Yes, where is the, we got the, we got, So my, my question was that uh, the one third in the miras that I'm holding or have discussion on, that's only after I'm dead or even in my life. Because my understanding is if I'm holding the property, say property A, while I'm alive, I can give it all to A, B, C, whatever. Exactly. That's a good question. That's a good point. You're right. You have, you have authority, full discretionary authority that would be governed by your own conscience during your lifetime over your property. Although Islamic law does allow the heirs to challenge that, and they do challenge that. I mean, some of you guys are just so badly misbehaved, so badly misbehaved. You know what you do? I, you know what you do, or what you've done in the past? When you're about to die, you divorce your wife. Hmm. Obviously, you know why. Why? Because she wouldn't inherit from you. I don't know what happened in your life, brother, but seriously? So the judge steps in and he nullifies that. Always remember, when I have done lots of readings on the stuff. I haven't written anything, but I've done. Judges in Islam generally have always favored the downtrodden. You look at, there, there's a Jewish woman in, in, in Jerusalem who studied all of these sigils that came out of the courts of, of J Jerusalem. 90% of the, of the rulings were in favor of women. Because the judge knows the man, see. <laughs> so in that case, you certainly have the right to giving, give things away. But if you're doing that with, with, with this kind of of nefarious objective in mind, then the judge will, will he'll nix it. He will not allow it. But you have, obviously then you have to go, into, go to litigation, which can be a problem. But, but yes, you, that was a good point you raised. You have, you have total authority over what you do prior to your death, but you cannot dictate how things are going to occur after you die. That's why you have to you set your, 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 your business in order uh, bef before that day comes by, okay? So the other is, what things can, you, can, can be distributed or, or, or can be put into waqf? According to, generally when you're looking at matters pertaining to politics and, and, and business, 
the, 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 the default school of law is the Hanafi. In Egypt, the entire economic system there that, that tries to follow Islam to the extent possible is based on Hanafi law. Saudi Arabia as well. Many, most of these Muslim countries base it on Hanafi law and there's one important reason for that. Hanafi law has been an imperial law for all the time. The Abbasids made Hanafi law the law of the state. And it was the law not for a century, it was there for 540 years. And then the Ottomans came about. The official law of Ottoman Islam and Ottoman Empire was Hanafi law. Then the Mughals came about. Now you see it? It's massive. You have volumes and volumes and volumes. Not just, this is the, the other difference. Hanafi law is law in practice, not law in theory. Whereas Hanbali law in particular is largely law in theory. Because it was never practiced. So historical circumstances, they gave prominence to one legal system over another. Which is not to say that we're promoting one school over the other. I for one am a Shafi myself. It's simply pointing out that the basis of the laws are such because of, of his historical precedent. You got that? So the, and then when you look at Hanafi law with regard to these things, what is striking is you need, Hanafi law, whose law is it? Abu Hanifa. It is really Abu Hanifa's law. That's, that's the striking thing about, particularly the Hanafi law. It is really Abu Hanifa's law. It is what Abu Hanifa says and then what the fatwa is. And he had two star pupils, one Muhammad al Shaybani and the other was Abu Yusuf. So whenever you find this is the law, they tell you this is, this is the ruling according to Abu Hanifa, but the fatwa is on Abu, Shah, Abu Yusuf. Or, because Abu Hanifa was a theoretician. He was like Ahmad ibn Hanbal. When he spoke about the law, it was in abstraction. He was not in charge of any legal system. Abu Yusuf, you have an entire kitab called Kitab al-Kharaj, which deals with the distribution of, of, of property and things like that, that is gotten to you by way of war. And he could do it. He was the chief Qadi of the Ottoman em of, of the uh, Abbasid Empire. So he's written volumes upon it. And his best buddy, class fellow, stopped talking to him. Now this brings me back to that, that that mentality we have. As soon as he took the job with Abu, with, with, uh, with, uh, the, Qa, with uh, the Ottoman Empire, he said, I'm done with you. You see, you're now, you're now on the payroll of the state. You're now in the, you understand? And as much as we are thankful to uh, Muhammad ibn, uh, Muhammad al-Shaybani, he's written some wonderful works on politics and government. He is the, the go-to person. In fact, in Washington, D.C., there is a center called the Shaybani Institute that deals with, with politics and Islam. But Abu, Abu Yusuf, he made a massive contribution to our understanding of how the law is actually applied in principle. What we have to understand is, for the most part, our practice of Islam is restricted to what is called the ibadat. Five times salah, fasting in the month of Ramadan, and so on. But if you lived in Abbasid Islam, or you lived in Ottoman Islam, or you lived in the Mughalist, you had to marry according to Islamic law, divorce according to Islamic law, have your estate distributed according to Islamic law, build your houses according to Islamic law. Did you think about that. Islamic law has strict rules about building a house. Absolutely. Hmm. Fascinating. If you go down that road, it is fascinating. So if you're putting a balcony in your house, Mr. Rada, putting a balcony will tell you, Islamic law will tell you it has to be eight feet above. You cannot put a balcony less than eight feet. Doesn't that sound like something straight out of Dr. D Dr. Malik's daily problems with the city? Bylaws. Right? Building code. Hmm. 
why, why eight feet? We use the exact terms, except those terms are in Arabic and our terms are. Because when the camel goes underneath that in a street, then you have to allow for the camel, camel, allow for the hawda, you know, that little thing that they sit on, and whatever other merchandise and stuff that people have to put on there. That's only, that's when the camel can go through. Therefore, when you're putting your balcony on there, make sure it's eight feet high. And when you're doing that, you are, you are in a give and take situation. Ibadah has a very different mindset from Mu'amala. In Ibadah, you want to maximize your benefits. In Mu'amala, you want to minimize your liabilities. <laughs> you understand? Why are you doing that? Well, because I'm human. Because I'm human. As a human being, this is what. Recently, there was a big thing going on. Some, some, and we'll talk about that in Miras. Man died, left ch children behind. And then he, uh, his brother then took control of the estate. So he's managing the estate for the, for the kids who are very young. Then the children reached the age of maturity. Talk about misbehaving Muslims. The children reach the age of maturity and now that he has to hand back to them what is rightfully theirs. From that period when his brother died to the time that he was going to distribute it, return it to the heirs, he had invested that. And he made some really good investments. Really, really good investments. Now he wants to give back the estate on the value it has. It held. <laughs> then you go fatwa shopping. No, no, he went fatwa shopping. You know, you, you and I take out, we, we cut coupons to find the cheapest price. Literally went to Olama of Saudi, see, South Asian, he's Indian. He went to Olama there. He went to, this is this good, there's a really unfortunate part of the story and a wonderful part of the story. He went to Egypt. He went to every alim he could find. He couldn't find one. He couldn't find one who could concur with his decision. Not one. He also said, you will have to give it to them at, 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 the, at the going rate. He did. No, no, that's not all his money. He, he invested. No, no, this is pure greed. Pure greed. He invested $10,000 in 1955 and he bought this piece of land. Right? Right here. Say, to, oh, this whole area. 10000 bucks. He bought the whole thing. 5000 was, was was his and 5000 was his dead brother's. So he says, inshallah, when, when it matures, I'll give back my dead brother's 5000 Giving... <laughs> His argument was, I just took the 5,000 and I put it in a, in a, I didn't touch it. <laughs> so we learn a lot from that. So if, you, if you do that, you, and you invest it, then, then the heirs, the owners, they must also understand that, this, that the loss that is suffered will also be shared. You know, but on, the, on the upside, you enjoy the profits, but the downside is if, if, if he lost his shirt, then your shirt is gone as well. So we learn a lot from these things. Any questions? According to some reports, it is yeah. But if you if you do, well, you are the you 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 you're the guy the guardian. See, you're the guardian. And understand one thing: you're living. Islam must be understood without government and a governmental umbrella. In other, today we live under a governmental umbrella, whether it is here or in Pakistan or in Malaysia. So whatever we do is, 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 is ultimately governed by the state. There was no state. That's why this, this, the, 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 the secondary custodians are so important in Islam, like you taking care of your brother's children, you taking care, and, because there's no one else to do this. There's no social security system. There's no Uncle Sam, there's no federal government, there's nothing like that. And yet people have to be taken care of. 
Orphans have, orphans have to be taken care of. Widows have to be taken care of. So how do you do that? A, a, a big dose of morality and some law. In our system, notice, morality plays no role. Absolutely no role. It, it's, it would sound absurd. Say, okay, I decide to give it to uh, that could do outside court, not here. Yes. I was going to ask, but there must be a provision for if you're managing, you're the custodian of uh, some orphans thing. Uh, just like in business world we do, we invest people with the, uh, money with each other and somebody manages it and takes a cut or a fee for managing it. There is no such thing allowed if, if you're the custodian of an If orphan. you're the custodian of orphan, orphan assets, no. So even if you because the orphans are not uh, not able legally uh, able to give you that consent, see? Oh. you can yeah yeah that's a good point you're making that that if look you, you're going to incur certain expenses. Uh, he's asking that you know that c can we can we uh, there is a, there is a stipulation that says look you know in taking care of your orphan's wealth or property, you're going to incur certain expenses. Certainly you have the right, or you, you're, you're going to spend time doing that. What happens if, you, if, if you're the, 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 the poor brother in the family and the, the rich one dies, and now you have to stop whatever little you're doing and take care of that. Surely you must have some kind of income. So yeah, that's Bil Maruf, that you, you're, you, that's where conscience comes in. It says, well, who, how are you going to do this? How much will you think is, is, is enough for you? You see, so, so taqwa is, a, is, without taqwa, the entire Islamic system collapses. It just collapses. Because it depends on you making the right decision. And in terms of your own humanity, nothing can polish you and perfect you as a human being as your exercise of taqwa. Nothing. Because in your moment of power, you exercise your strength. In your moment where you have a chance to do something, you give somebody else the opportunity. All of those things make you a better human being. They make you a better human being. You can only do that if you are driven by this impulse of taqwa. Okay. Uh, in wasiyah, you have total discretion to do whatever you want to. Um, then you have the type who says one is non-fungibles. This is a difference between the Maliki school in particular and the Hanafi school. Uh, that Maliki say if you have cash, you can give cash as, as waqf as well. Hanafi say no, it must be real estate or it must be something that has long-term life. It shouldn't be a fungible that can just, you know, except in the case of a land with uh, equipment on it. So tractor, trees, seeds, that's considered part of that land, so that, that is accepted. But for the, for the basis of the, of, of, of the waqaf itself, you have to have something that is, that is uh, uh, a, a non-fungible, all right? And in Mirath and Wasiyah, you can have both. So in, to, to summarize what is the difference between Waqf, Mirath, and Wasiyah, Mirath is strictly governed by the Quran. Waqf is, has certain basic outlines that are instituted by the, by, by the Sharia, but you have a great deal of discretionary power. And wasiya is, is largely driven by the overall teachings of Islam and your own conscience. You said the Sheikh Hanafi, he said only real estate can be uh, waqf, however. Yes, Maliki it's the best example. Or, or, or if you have things like 
I, I'm just thinking of, it's the easiest one to explain. There might be others that fall into the category, but generally it's things that are not easily exhausted, like, like money. Money gets exhausted. By exhausting, it gets finished. But you know, it, 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 this must have a, a long-term life, in other words. This is my point, actually, because you said Imam Malik, uh, he also included the cash as a waqf. Now, I want to know, because the cash is not exist for a long time. Exactly. Long, yeah, this is the, the, my point that I want to uh, more uh, clarification on. Yeah, the, the Maliki school is a lot more is more is a lot more accommodating in terms of the different commodities that fall into the category of waqf, and that so th that's the reason why the Hanafis don't allow it because it 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 gets exhausted quickly. Whereas this you know waqf is meant to to you see if you go back to the basic basis of waqf. It's that hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which says that when you die the matam with the mata ibn Adam Naam, the three things that he leave behind. You heard, you heard about the three things you leave behind, right? One is Sadaqa Jariya. Sadaqa Jariya. Jari it keeps going. Jaryan. It has a flow to it. Continuity, absolutely, yes. And then there's a, a child who, who prays for you when you die. And the third one is? Education, Education that's right. Which can also be fall into the category of, of Sadaqa Jariya. So that's the basis of it, that you want to give it this kind of Jaryan, of moving from generation to generation to generation. Uh... Well, if I got a ten thousand dollars, I give it waqf. And uh, uh, why can't it be? That's a good question. That is a good question uh, because I want my children. I'm not now changing the money. I have a million dollars. I want to give it waqf. Look, look, the Maliki, the Maliki. Viewpoint can quickly move from fungible to non-fungible. Let me show you how. I have a million dollars now, and I want to give it off as waqf. I want my children to, to control it. That already tells you that in terms of milkia ownership, you want to hold on to it. You don't want the ownership of it to go. If you give it sadaqa, that's the other difference. You transfer ownership immediately. You lose control over it. You don't want to con lose control over it. So waqf is a very important mechanism when you don't want to lose control of your asset. You simply want others to share in the benefits of it. You, you understand? You got it now? And then what your children do, what your son does, is he turns that waqf into a long-term waqf by buying a property. He says, instead of just keeping cash, which loses, lose, loses value every day anyway, Put it into 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 an asset with with a greater likelihood of of growth, so he can do that. Okay. A college endowment. Yes. Okay, let's move on. So the origins of waqf. I may have left something out, but let's move on. Uh, the origins of waqf go back to this the story of Omar, which is which encapsulates the whole thing because it. It summarizes it. That, that uh, he comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for those who were not here early on. And he says, I've got this piece of land that has come to in my possession in, uh, in Khaybar. And I would like to give it away as a donation. He said, don't do that. Uh, I also, I think Rasulullah looked at Omar and then he looked at Omar and said, don't do that. Because he understood the, uh, Omar's administrative skills and his, his brilliance. And he says, don't do that. He may not have given the same advice to somebody else. But the advice was such that it set, it set the parameters for us to deal with wealth. He says, hold on to the property and let others enjoy the benefit. And your family can also enjoy the benefit. That becomes the basis of it. 
the other one is that when Uthman, there's a very famous, in fact, I think the well is still avail, is still uh, operating in Medina. You can check it out. Uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, story about him. Uh, he, uh, he was in Medina and he saw that uh, people were being ch charged for, for using the well. And so he went to uh, the owner of the well. He says, you know, I'll buy it from you. He says, no, I'm not selling. He says, all right. He goes back to him later. And he says, I'll rent it from you. He says, okay, how much? He gave him a huge figure. Make him an offer he can't refuse. So he says, uh, okay, you know, every alternate day, you can have it. Big mistake. Because what he found was, on the day Uthman was renting it, everybody was taking water. See, that's business acumen, see. And on the day when the guy had his own, nobody was taking water. Then he came back to us and says, yeah, please take it from me. <laughs> so that well is still, still, still working. Then, now things have changed. But when I was a student in Mecca, the water that we used to consume was not the, 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 the Zamzam. We used to consume water from called Ain Zubaida. Ain Zubaida. Zubaida was the wife of Harun al-Rashid. And one night she had this really strange dream. That's why I'm telling you, don't come to me if you want dreams interpreted. Maybe Hafizab can help you, but I, it's, dreams are very convoluted. So her dream was that she goes to the sheikh and she tells the sheikh, I have this horrible dream. He says, what do you dream? He says, I'm just giving birth to endless babies. Just giving birth to endless babies. He says, Abshiri, be happy. What do you mean be happy? <laughs> he says, you're giving life to people. You're giving life to people. Giving birth is giving life. So she she put in that well, and imagine when I was a student, they used to drink from the same water. So uh, the Azhar has given spiritual life to people, all waqf. Azhar is fascinating. Now it stopped, but when I was there for a short while, they used to do exactly what happened in Deoband, the other place I was at. I had to go to many places to educate. It's pretty you know, hard for me to get educated. Lots of people had to work on me. Anyway, <laughs> so what happens is the, the institute was actually supported by, by the people of the territory, of the people in the area. It may be the case in, in wherever you come from. So at the end, when, har during harvest time, you know, they set aside whatever is required. This is for eating, this is for seed for next year, and so on. This is for the Azhar. And so on one day, they would all gather and all bring their ways and they would donate it to the other. That's how these, these institutions supported themselves. And to this day, maybe it has changed, but to this day in Deoband, you go one day, all, there's one day open to ladies. And the ladies are coming in and they're bringing their, their distribu to distribute, to, to, to give to them. So you can feed the, 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 your, your students or you can sell it and use the money to, for upkeep. So that's how we managed our institutions. That idea made its way to England. The idea of, of, of these waqf, endowment-based institutions. And there a college was established called Merlin College. Or Merton College. I think it's Merlin College. And what did Merton or Merlin be go on to become? Oxford University, 1258. So, you know... Some of us, some of them call us unhum uh, inhuman or barbaric, but we have a legacy we, we can rightly be proud of. We can be proud of. And uh, so this is the origins of the waqf. As for the recipients of the waqf, they differ. We said that uh, they are the usual recipients, mosques, schools, things like that the poor. The unusual recipients are non-Muslims, 
non-Muslims. In miras, I'll be giving you this contrast. In miras, you cannot give to a non-Muslim. Well, you don't, you don't have the authority anyway. Because when, be, me, the laws of miras only kick in when you die. You cannot give. What you can do, and this happens, this is a question that's thrown at the ulama, often in America in particular, is because you know, you're a convert and you, ha you have parents and so on, so you want to know what to do with it. But that's where you, this comes in. The one third, the one third you can use to distribute to your parents, your brothers, and so on. Or before you die, you establish a waqf, put your entire estate into that waqf, the advantage of using the waqf as opposed to the miras is that you have more control of how that particular your estate will be distributed and used. That's the huge in our modern age the waqf is very very significant because it gives you that that it gives you added discretionary power. You understand? Which miras won't won't give you. So before you if you want to take the option of the waqf then you do that prior to your death, you set up a waqf, you put in your entire estate into that waqf, and then you designate who is go are, are going to be the beneficiaries of that waqf, and they can very well be non-Muslims as well. <laughs> exactly, because you, you are, you, you are being, you are, your distribution pattern is determined entirely by your own taqwa. Yeah. So in local terminology, obviously waqf is not used. You know, you have the trusts and you have the wills and so forth. Would a living trust be uh, equivalent to the kind of work? I was you hoping just you wouldn't ask me that question. See, <laughs> because <laughs> I'll, living... I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because I, 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 for the most part, I've been living in South Africa, so I'm familiar with. And while the word "living trust" is used there as well, it in terms of details, it might not be. So, inshallah, the next time we have this outside Ramadan, we will talk about it. Okay. But he, this, here's the to. to Hopefully, I, I, let me just say what I want to say, that uh, if you, what we, we should be doing is looking at a living trust model that is American and picking out from there the elements that we find objectionable and, and dealing with that to the extent possible and then just accepting it as a waqf. It's basically a concept that you own, you have a control on it as long as you are living. Yes. But then you have the instructions as to how that gets distributed. Distributed, exactly, exactly. Okay. So that's that's the living trust, yeah. There is also an irrevocable trust. Yeah, revocable and irrevocable. That's right. Uh, so these are, you know, most I would, I don't know, most people don't know too much about trust. I would think so. I'm, that 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 that's that's my base, and I'm just giving you the the. Uh, Inshallah, this thing requires a great deal more uh, study and, and, and uh, explanation, and we can do that at some other time. But yeah, you're right. In Islam, we also have waqf am and waqf khas, you know, with, with family endowments and general endowments. So we do have that as well. All right. Yeah. Two quick questions. Mm -hmm. First is uh, the amount that you put in waqf, is that part of the one-third discretionary, or can you put the entire state in work? You can put your entire state in work. Okay. And the second one is, if somebody is getting something from Miras, like his or her part, can that person also get something additional from the Vasiya, the one-third discretionary part? No. Okay. No. Miras, Miras, this is the Sunni perspective, a, 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 a warith will not inherit will not get from the from the from the uh wasiya. no double dipping simple way to remember did you have a question no. yeah so i have two questions so uh the first one is when you're doing work then you're not following the rules of uh, uh Basi, uh miras and you're not uh, following yes yes hold on you're not following the rules of miras but you are following the rules of islam 
a very that's a good question and I have to stop it right there <laughs> because many because many of my colleagues object to to to, to waqf this is you know you're just using a back door to he says but this is unless you show me otherwise waqf is strictly islamic it is strictly islamic and and I'll tell you now that you 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 let that cat out of the bag <laughs> One of the reasons waqf is becoming more popular is because it, it uh, circumscribes the problem of giving half to the woman to, as you give to a man. You know, daughter gets half what a man gets. So to avoid that, you just put it into a trust and so on, and, and it's done. More importantly, however, your, your expiry date is not known to you. And that kind of uncertainty creates a lot of economic financial problems. Lots of financial problems. If your estate is small, alhamdulillah. He says, you know, I've got this loaf of bread. When the loaf of bread is done, I'm done. That's great. But you don't know if there's any parallel movement of the expunging of your estate and your death. And so because of that, not all children are as sympathetic and conscious of their obligations to you. So how do you protect yourself when you get senile? You suffer from all kinds of diseases, what's it called? Alzheimer's and all these. How do you protect yourself? Big problem. In, I live in a, in, in, in a commercial community, so we hear the big problem. Very big problem. The one way to do that is to have a waqf. So on the one hand, yes, these are the laws of yusikum Allahu fi awladikum. This is miras. But if, you, if in this day and age, uh, if you, you have to find a way, and you do it quickly, find a way to protect yourself. Protect your wife. Generally, women are not as financially literate as are men, generally. Uh, don't get, catch me afterwards, please. But generally. How do you protect her? You, I, I, I don't like saying this. I, you should not leave this to the good conscience of your children. Bad idea. Bad idea. You pray, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the hidayah to treat them properly. But that doesn't happen ever, often. It doesn't happen often. So you have to protect them. So yes, this movement towards waqf distribution is becoming more prominent because we have these modern challenges. And just one more question. So uh, what's your perspective of uh, some people uh, back home or otherwise, uh, you know, before they die, they like to do the miras in, during their lifetime. So, in, so totally, miras is only after death. Totally haram. Oh. Haram. Totally haram. So when you mention waqf is getting popularity, but the type of uh, different people have different uh, proportions of... Uh, <coughs> Uh, money in cash, retirement accounts, uh, and uh, uh, home, and but the work only deals with the tangible, the uh, home, and does not deal with cash or in retirement. It does not, yeah. So how do we reconcile that? Uh, I don't know immediately. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's why we have to work on this. I've been looking at what kind of how much work is being done. For the most part, we are still on, at the level of establishing awqaf. So there are many, many awqaf. We don't have, we need, we need centers where people don't value education. And, uh, you know, we need knowledge centers where you can have scholars sit down and say, okay, yes, uh, you know, yes, $5,000 for you, come in here three times a week, and we want you to work on work for us. These are our questions. Work on it. You really need, you need that. In, in the past, you had governments that sponsored the ulama and so uh, Ghazali would not be Ghazali without Nizamul Mulk. Ghazali, always remember, 
He had the benefactor, his name was Nizam al -Mulk. He funded Ghazali. And you and I are benefiting from him. Nizam al Muk visited the college one day and he was very disappointed. He got there, and all of the students were like me, chilling, having fun. So he says, Man, this is a bad investment. Then I said, You went out, there was, you know, the people had these lamps here. So you studied. He was studying on the lamp. So as he goes out, he sees this kid sitting there, and he looks at him and says, what's your name? He says, Abu Hamid. He says, oh, so what are you doing? He says, I'm studying. What do you think I'm doing? He says, oh, all right, then there's hope. That was, that was Imam al-Ghazali. In other words, he was getting irritated that this man is disturbing him. I have work to do. Please leave me alone. Obviously not knowing who this man is. That this is, the, this is your benefactor. So it's important for us to think in those directions, is that we have to find, and like, like you point out, you know, these, these questions are, I've looked at, I've been looking at this material, and you, you kind of look at, people are working toward establishing, there's an Oqaf in America as well now. I don't know what it's called, but it's oh, something called, to do with Oqaf. So there are Waqfs all over the place. But you need, you, you need because our, our financial situation is extremely complicated is extremely complicated, even at the basic level. Even at the basic level, we're not talking about people who are investing in, 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 in things that you can't pronounce properly. So what do we do with that? And, and they have good reason to do that because ultimately you want to protect your, your, your wealth, you want to maximize your returns, and therefore it is prudent that you do that. But in so doing, you've just complicated something that started out pretty simple. Okay. No, there's no hiba here. Yeah, there's uh, wasiya is hiba is is will probably be another category for hiba, but I, I don't want to get there. There there's some categories I've left out. For instance, there's there's uh, there's a category called habs. Habs. And Habs is, is, is uh, very popular amongst the Shia. Shia. The Shia and the, and the Malikis, ex they accept fungible endowments. And if you look at the Shia uh, 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 economic landscape, they have multiple, far more categories than we do. So they, for them, Habs, for us, Habs is synonymous with Waqf. For them, Habs and Waqf are not the same thing. Okay? So, so that's why I didn't put it on here, all right? May I ask a question? Yes. Um, so the discussion that happens in my generation of friends is that now we have elderly parents, and they're all working on their wills. And there's always this dis uh, discussion about the distribution of you know, the inheritance rules between sons and daughters. So is, there, is that just pure Sharia black and white answer for that? Or is there something else that can be like, put into an endowment? Look, there's one bunch, one group of scholars that that want to micromanage Mirat, and I, I, I don't belong to that school. Uh, I'm open to many suggestions, but I believe that the 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 structure of the Mirat should be left as is. It's one of these laws that are firmly embedded in the Quran, and you're going to have serious problems if you mess with it. So just leave it as is. If you want to address the issue that you raise transfer everything into an endowment and you know like he pointed out you have ready-made systems right now instruments right now that you can just put it straight into and 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 when i many years ago probably 25 years ago uh, a group of these syrian doctors got hold of me and we spent months together working on distributing their estate according to Islamic law. I, we had meetings with their attorneys and all the rest of it. Unfortunately, we didn't document a lot of that. But, uh, but at that time, we came up with a, a, a kind of a mishmash between the waqf and, and the miras. And now my, my, my understanding of this is, is more mature and, and, and the instruments themselves are, are more easily available. So certainly, if you have that challenge, do that. If you want to stay within the, the confines of traditional strict Islamic law, then Miras is, is 
clearly your option number one. So I'm not asking everyone to move away from the laws of Irs and to, ex to move their property to Waqf, but some of us will have to because of circumstances. Uh, I do have a question about the Miras again. We're not touching Miras yet. Okay. We're just so making a yani, muqarana between Miras, Waqf, and so on. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll talk about Miras. Okay. The, 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 the heirs, who gets what, and, and all that. We'll talk about that tomorrow, inshallah. So just so I get it straight, um, we are saying that we can circumvent the laws of Miras. By no, I didn't say that. By, well, uh, well, that's why I understood it. We can circumvent the laws of Miras by simply putting everything in the walk, and then the sister's question is answered. Then I can distribute from the walk everything equally between daughters and sons. I'm saying you have to. <laughs> 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 but that's why I understood, right? Right? That's what, that's what you said. <laughs> so, I'm saying you have two instruments in Islam yeah. to distribute your estate. They're both equally valid. The one is based on Islam law, and the other one is based on Islamic law. The one is strictly Islamic law, right down to the, to the, to the dollar and the cents. The other one is not. The one has no discretion in it, the other one does have discretion in it. But, but, they're both within the Sharia. Walhamdulillah. So can we take out that word circumvent? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm listening, go ahead. Uh, you said both are according to Sharia, but uh, uh, again, uh, if somebody has misinterpretation, uh, 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 they can put uh, that. Uh, so is there any guideline or deadline to do it? Uh, a person who is go uh, going to die uh, maybe a week uh, from now um, because of uh, terminal in, uh, illness, uh, and he does that. Uh, uh, at the last moment, uh, is there any restriction of for the time limit or not? <laughs> Look, to address that particular concern, I would advise you to do the following. If you have a very modest estate, one house, then you can use miras, fine. But, and I don't want you to be there, by the way. I, I, I want you to be away from that. I want to see you I want you to, to be multi, multi-millionaires. I always tell my students that. I don't want you to have a million, I want you to have multiple millions. Because at, when you die, what happens to your money? It comes back to us. It comes back to us. It comes back to us, it gets redistributed. In Islam, the idea is for you to prosper, but to live frugally. You should eat dry bread, certainly, but you should own a bakery. Let's keep that imagery in mind. Eat dry bread, but own a bakery. But own a bakery. But for those who cannot, and who have to make do with half a loaf, here's is the way to go. But if you have a complicated estate, then put your estate into a trust or into a waqf. Have an alim group or someone someone you trust m help be, be a joint administrator if you like, and then. So that person can give you the guidance that you require so that you make certain that your estate is distributed according to the sharia. But you protect yourself, you, like you said, I don't know, I'm gonna go in a week or two weeks or maybe five years, you don't know that. To protect yourself personally, more importantly, to protect your wife. The, the, the trust, the, the waqf works better. So you put it into a waqf, appoint a, a, a group of scholars who would be, and we're not even there yet where we have, in, 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 in back home we have a, a group that's dedicated to that commercial community, so therefore these things are important to us. We need a group of scholars who are experts in this and say, well, all right, we'll manage the, the waqf for you and uh, in conjunction with whatever your, your requirements are. Before you set up the work, we'll have to tell you this is un inappropriate, that is inappropriate, and so on. So that way in which, inshallah, you should cover, cover both areas.
No. No. It doesn't come that easy. Yeah. It doesn't come that easy. Uh, there are some technical issues, legal issues about whether a waqf is revocable or irrevo ir irrevocable. And uh, some schools say it's, in other words, once you, you, you write out your waqf, is that irrevocable or not? And so uh, without going into detail about who the schools are, some of the questions they ask, the reason I'm sharing this with you is, is because there's a lot of thought even in the earlier times. It says, once you to paper, is that a done deal or can, you, can that be revoked? So others say, no, it, cannot, it, it, it is revocable until the donee, the recipient, accepts it. Then it's not. In other words, say I'm going to give 100,000 to IUGD, and IUGD says we accept, then it becomes irrevocable. Then it becomes irrevocable. You understand? Because now you, it's, you, now you actually have two contracts going. You have one with, between you and Allah where you put this on paper, and the other is with the third party, which is, then it becomes irrevocable, which makes the greatest sense to me, which is Abu Yusuf's fatwa, I think. But it also brings up a very interesting tidbit on the side. And I didn't know this rule until I got enmeshed in a divorce settlement 30 years ago. I get a call from Chicago, uh, divorce between two parties. And uh, the husband asks for the jewelry back. And so they go to the, the mufti at that time. And he says, he's, yeah, he has to give it back. She has to give the jewelry back. And I was taken aback. No, no, he, they came to me first and asked me, what's the ruling here? And I says, no, he cannot do that. He can't ask for the jewelry back. You understand what I'm saying? Or you want to? OK. You cannot ask for it back. And so then the, the mufti there, he calls me and he says, is this, is this the ruling you gave? I said, yes. He says, but that's not the ruling according to Hanafi law. I, said, I didn't know that. He says, according to Hanafi law, it is permissible for the husband to take back the jewelry. So the basis of my ruling, I said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he ex exemplified this in a very graphic way. And you're fasting, so I'll share it with you. In a very graphic way. He said, taking back gifts, this is Rasulullah now. And he was very eloquent. But when the need arose, he could be very blunt. He says, taking back gifts is a, like a dog who pukes. And then what does he do? But then the Mufti Saab responded to me. He says, well, then let him be a dog. That was the genius of Abu Hanifa. No, no, that was the genius of Abu Hanifa. He says, the rule is the rule. And your akhlaq is something else. You want to take it back? Fine. You want to be like a dog? Go ahead. So the Shafi'i school was different. It says, no, that rule, that statement of Rasulullah was not nasiha, it was hukum. That was the base. base. In other words, is Rasulullah giving you advice? He says, you really want to do this stuff? Or is Rasulullah saying, this is so bad, it's equal. You, you see, it, you can, it can go both ways. Is Rasulullah just simply advising you, or is he telling you this is the rule? For, for the Shafi'is, this is the rule. For the Hanafis, that was Rasulullah's advice, not, not his, his ruling. He says, don't be like that. So the same applies here in this case with, with walk of property. Can you, can you take it back? Should you not take it back? And all the rest of it. And all of these, all of these play in. So now we can get to abuse of waqf. One of them is to deprive the heirs of their rights. Look, to, to answer his question, 
when you when you decide to be equal in your distribution of your estate, the man can indeed go to court and says, "I'm being deprived of what is rightly mine." Allah Himself said so. And if you use waqf, you're depriving me of that. And uh, that is true. If you if that's your if that's your sole purpose, then certainly that that's something that you have to think about when you incorporate these rules that alter the, the distribution pattern, then that can happen. So there is that, that problem that you have to take into consideration. But waqf is not should not be abandoned just because everybody's going to go is going after it for that particular reason, see? Uh, to avoid zakat payments. Hmm. Because waqf property is not subject to zakat. Remember, it's a, it's a separate corporation. You see how easy now it is to avoid paying zakat? Put your property into waqf, make yourself a beneficiary. See that? <laughs> Remember what I told you at the beginning of the class? That in matters of ibadat, you try to maximize your benefits. In matters of mu'amalat, you try to minimize your liabilities. Where's the mic? How are you? Yeah. The prime example is when President Ziad decided to deduct zakat <laughs> from the accounts people had in the banks. Everyone became? So everyone became Shia, <laughs> whoever who could, because their ruling was that it could not be taken from them and distributed to the rest of the population. You and got the, it? And the second thing they did, that on, they used to take this out on the 31st of December. So generally around the 15th of December, they will take the money out and put it back in January. <laughs> so. So we do all kinds of these things. So uh, again, I'm going to say it for the third time. Our tendency generally as human beings has been that in terms of ibadat, we try to maximize our benefits. In terms of mu'amalat, we try to minimize our liability. There's a book there, in very popular book among scholars. It's called Kitab al -Hiyal. The different guises and instruments you can use to avoid Zakat payment, for instance, and other payments. So here's something I did not mention at the outset. It, it's important if you want to know, uh, you under, under, want, uh, want to understand, know the, the uneven distribution between male and female. You know, men get twice what women get. So the most important thing you have to remember is in Islam, there is no community of property. In Islam, there is no community of property. This is a very quirky thing about Western society. They have, because of Christianity, they have established within their legal system a community of property that makes no economic sense. So here is, let's just assume he's not married, and there's, uh, there's uh, Zubayda here. He owns $10, she owns a million dollars, and then they, come, they perform the nikah, or they come to me in court and I perform the marriage, and then what happens to him after the marriage, immediately after the marriage? He's an equal heir or beneficiary to that million dollars. On what basis? On the basis of marriage. You understand? In Islam, there's no such thing. What belongs to the male belongs strictly, strictly to the male. What belongs to the female belongs strictly to the female. If they adjust their holdings accordingly, that's different. It, it does not mean that if, if you buy a house, it has to be split into, no, no. If you want to, within a marital household, you can have a partnership. And it's important for you to remember that. Because some of you abuse this also. Oh man, you guys can be so abusive. Ah. <sighs> so you have a MashaAllah, you know, Allah's given you a lot. You became a very good engineer at General Motors, and you did very well. 
amassed this great amount of money. Your house alone cost $2 million, and now you decide to divorce your wife. You run to the sheikh and say, Ya sheikh, I'm divorcing my wife. Please distribute it according to Hasb al-Sharia al-Islamiyya. According, strictly, huh, sheikh? According to the Islamic rules. You know what he wants from the sheikh, right? That she must be totally cut off and cut out from his estate. So the sheikh will, the sheikh follows the rules only. Then he says, you have to give her something. He says, okay, we'll give her a hundred thousand dollars. You have an, you have amassed an estate of five million dollars and you want to give her have hundred thousand dollars. Now, on the other hand, you married this woman, Zubeda, and the next day you divorce. Well, now that law has changed. I think longevity plays a part in distribution now, right? You can't just get exactly half the estate. That must, I think that's the case now. But after a short period of time, you, you know, if, you, if your marriage splits, you're getting half. So on, you have this one extreme on this side where the woman gets absolutely nothing, and on the other hand where you get this. So you have to, when you, when you are working your estate, you have to keep that in mind, that, that these partners of yours, they, when you sign a document and you say that she co-owns that property, you know, when you, when the, on the title deed, she legally, it's, she owns that property with you. And the sheikh, sometimes he's ignorant of that. I don't know how you can be. If you own a house, you know that. You buy a house here, both partners, names are, and, and Sharan, you sign the document. You can't say, well, that was a requirement of the law. No, nobody put a gun to your head. Nobody put a gun to your head. You signed the document willingly, voluntarily. She's a partner in that estate. You own your practice, and she, she's a partner in that. If you want to maintain a separation, that's your right, that's your prerogative. But you must follow that through. You must follow that through. That's number one. In num number two, in Islam, especially according to Hanafi law, the woman has no financial obligations. In Maliki law, she does. If she is, like in his case, married to Zubayda and she's got a million dollars, Zubayda must help in the house. But Hanafi law, no. Zubayda can help, mashallah. The Imam will tell Zubayda, you know what, help him out. But she has no obligations. No obligations to take, to, to raise the kids. Let me put, put that one in. She has no obligation to raise the kid. She has, she delivers the kid, he says, mashallah, here's your kid, take care of the child. You want me to take care of the child? It's gonna cost you. It's gonna cost you. So we don't look at that part of the background. Number three, the woman does never belong to the household of the man. Let me put this up for you. This is an important one and we don't understand this in the modern age. When we, when we get married, this is what happens here. Male and female. That's a household, isn't it? That's a household. In Islam, it's like this. This is very important for tomorrow, inshallah. It's the man, his brother, his uncle, his nephew, his sister, his mother, his father. You see that now? You must understand this to understand what's going to happen tomorrow. So when he dies, his estate is not this. This is his estate. Because everything is slanted in that way. When we look at the verses, you will see it. She gets that, he gets that, he gets that, he gets that. She is an addendum. She is attached here. Where does she belong? On the other side. She belongs on the other side. She's got her mother, she's got her father, her brother, her sister. You see it now? You must understand this to make sense of, of the Islamic laws of inheritance. This is the most important basic thing that separates the modern family structure from the traditional structure.
that you actually don't belong to this household. You're married into this household, but you belong to a different household. Yeah, and then you get whatever it's on the other side. Exactly. <laughs> I had a question yes. about going back to when you were saying like the abuses of walk and you saying that some people uh, wrongfully maybe but um, will maybe put zakat into that so they can avoid paying like yeah, zakat. Yeah, I'm, yeah. When I'm thinking about like the Quran and maybe correct my thinking is that when you think about the uh, Bani Israel, when some of the people who had wanted to do the Sabbath and they put the nets out on one day, so they basically circumvented that, to use your terminology. That's called hila. And so then it was it turn, be them apes. So then how do we understand when somebody's doing this and, uh, you know, this ethically and then legally? Like, how does that, how does that? Which out? one do, do you want to, how uh, do we understand which one? Uh, when somebody's taking the zakat and putting it into a waq to avoid paying zakat, how do you understand that? So legally, what, what can you do to kind you of... You understand it by focusing on the most important word in Islam in terms of your self-development, which is what? Taqwa. I can't tell you how important it is. I just can't tell you how important it is. You know, it, 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 because you listen to it so often, there's so, so much reference to it in the Quran, you don't understand its managing principle. It has a role to play in your psyche, not in the afterlife. The afterlife is where you earn your, the afterlife is, is, is dormant. Nothing happens in the afterlife, understand that. Because you finish with it, you actually don't have any say, think about that. The afterlife is what you built for and then when you get there, okay, here's my house, my, here's, your, here's your title deed, mashallah, you can go. That's the afterlife, right? There's no negotiating in the afterlife. Everything happens where? And everything happens here. Your fate is determined here. And the key component to determine that fate, the reason you're sitting here till 11 o'clock at night and going to bed at 12 o'clock is because you want Allah to give you that taqwa. That particular story of the Jews is what separates them from the Christians. You have a morality without a law and you have a law without a morality. You see it? In Christianity, laws don't matter. It's the condition of the heart. In Judaism, it's all about law. I mean, if you think our fiqh is complicated, you should listen to the Jewish fiqh. Oh my God. It is extremely complicated. Extremely complicated. So you have a law without morality, and you have a morality without a law, and Allah says we have a law and a morality together here. I was going to tell you something. Let me give you a really bad example. It is neither waqf. I'm going to end here. Maybe we shouldn't be ending like this. And, it's, and it comes from, from your part of the world. You heard about this Quran Seshadi. People get married to the Quran. They get, and let me repeat myself, they get married to the Quran. One of the problems with, with distribution and estate is the breakdown of this. You, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, undeniable that uh, if your wealth is agglomerated together, then you have a bigger bounce. You can scale more easily. If you have $100, $100 there's only so much you can do with it. If you have 100000 your opportunity suddenly, and if you have a million dollars, you understand the, the so what happened in, in, in one part of, of, of one country, people owned large tracts of land, and they're unwilling to break it up. This is where waqf is so important. They have a solution there, but the ulama don't focus on it. That's my point for sharing this with you. They don't, want to distrib they don't want to break it up. And how will it be broken up if you lose, use the laws of miras? Now think carefully about this, this, I'm telling you. In the law of miras, your land will be broken up. Where will it go? 
see the problem now? Or it will go on this side. But mostly this is, this is female abuse. So it's going to go on this side. They don't want to distribute their land on the si other, other side. So they says, child, we have a wonderful, wonderful partner for you for marriage. I'm not kidding you. I'm telling you this is the truth. This is, this, I, I hope to, I'll, I, we pray inshallah that this thing gets out, you know, if, 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 the, if, if the past prime minister comes back, maybe it's something he can deal with. We hope so. So we have this lovely partner for you. I'm, Baba, who's my partner? The Quran. What do you mean? So you're going to get married to the Quran. And by Allah, they have a ceremony and they have this girl getting married to the Quran. Why? Because they don't want her to get married to a man and then the estate is going to be split and you see, you, you understand what, what, why they do this? So now this girl is, her entire life is destroyed because the estate must be protected. If however that estate was put it, into waqf, then you can even protect it on, the, on this side. There are ways of doing this. If you have, if, you, if your if your thinking was was more elastic, if it allowed you to think in 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 in, in more complicated ways, you would see we don't even have to do why we don't have to abuse our own kids in this way. Put your estate into a waqf, and that protects it. So yeah, this, we we have serious issues that we have to deal with. No, there's no such thing. It has no basis. It has no basis. It is absurd. It is nonsensical. It is just one way of destroying one, one person's life. <laughs> Haram is not even, it's too nice a word for it. Inshallah, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Allahu <laughs> Akbar.